Hello, and welcome to this session in which we would look at attribute sampling and how to compute the sample size. This is an extremely important topic on the CPA exam and in your auditing course. Understanding what attribute sampling, which is something that relates to internal control, is extremely critical for your success on the CPA exam. Now, if you are studying for your CPA exam, or if you are an accounting student, by all means, check out my website, farhatlectures.com. I don't replace your Becker, Roger, Gleam, or Wiley, or any other CPA course. I don't intend to do so. What I, what, I, what, what I can be is a useful addition to your CPA review course. I can add 10 to 15 points to your CPA exam score by explaining the material a little bit more in details, uh, slower. I don't assume any prior knowledge. So here's your risk. If you want to try me out, my subscription is $29.99. You can try it for a month. See if it helps. I mean, you can look at this recording and see if it's going to help you or not. That's your risk. Your potential gain is passing the exam. Are you willing to take that risk? So this is the difference between me and a CPA review course. I move much slower, much more in details. I don't assume anything. And please check out my website, if not for anything, just to check out how well is your university doing on the CPA exam. I do also have other accounting, tax and finance courses. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. And on LinkedIn, you can see review by other students who used my system to pass the exam recommendations and reviews by students. Please like this recording and share it. Connect with me on Instagram and Facebook. So the first thing we want to we want to know about attribute sampling. Once you hear the word attribute, think about internal control. We talked a lot about internal about internal control in this session. In this in this session specifically, we're going to be looking at internal control from a statistical when we test internal control. So why do we need to test internal control? What's the purpose of this? Why do we bother testing internal control? Well, the reason is, is to determine whether we are going to rely or not rely. So simply put, we're going to are we going to rely on the internal control or are we not going to rely? Now, we're going to go back to this RMM risk of material misstatement, and basically back to the audit risk model. And hopefully you remember this, but I'm going to just review it with you real quick. Remember, the audit risk model is AR, the audit risk, equal to, and if you don't know this, please go back to that recording, control risk times inherent risk times detection risk. And remember, control risk and inherent risk, they're called risk of material misstatement. And remember the relationship between RMM and detection risk, they are inversely related. When one goes up, the other one goes down. Basically, if you want to imagine this on a seesaw, if this is RMM and this is detection risk, when this goes up, let me let me show you in a different color. If this goes up, detection risk goes down. And the opposite is true. If RMM goes down, detection risk goes up detection risk goes up. So make sure you want to know the relationship and you want to know a lot about the audit risk model because it's part of your CPA exam. But I covered this in a separate recording, but make sure to know the basic relationship just for the purpose of this recording. So we are counting on the internal control. So if, if we decided to rely on the internal control, then we are, we, we are relying, we are counting on it. Why? So why do we do all of this? We'll try to reduce our substantive testing. If the internal control is good, we have we have we do less work. We do less work from our perspective. So we only test the control. We only test the control if we believe they are properly designed and obviously working. If they are not designed properly designed and properly working, we don't look for failing control. We, we just ignore the control and we don't rely on the internal control. If we believe they have good control, we will test them. Okay, so auditors are interested in, in the following type of exception and attribute sampling. We're looking for any deviation from the client established controls. So the, the client says, this is our internal control. You know, look at them, see if they are designed properly, see if they are working properly. Now what we're looking for is we, we are looking to see how well they are working properly. We're looking for any deviation, any instance where they are not working properly. Like what are we looking for? At, examples of attribute. Well, are we looking to see if all credit sales are approved by someone other than the person making the sales? So this is a good internal control, whether it's yes or no. If it's yes, that's good, but we want the, the design is good, but can we see approved for every sales on credit? We have this approval. Does shipment of goods always come before billing? Do we ship, then we bill. 
Well, we have to look at documents to find out if that's happening or not. Are all checks authorized, signed by an authority person? Or can anybody else sign the check? We need to look at the checks to find out. We need to inspect the checks. Are good only purchased from approved vendors? And all the answers, usually in the internal control in the real world, it has to be yes. Now they are yes, but you have to collect the evidence to find out if there's any deviation from what they are doing. So the design is good. Are they working properly in the real world? Okay, so this is the basic idea. Now we have to learn about important, extremely important concepts starting now till the end of this recording about sampling for internal control. When we do sampling, when we do testing of internal control, we're going to learn about terms that we use during the planning phase and some terms that we use when we're actually conducting the sampling and evaluating the results. So this is the planning phase. So we have three, three terms here that we have to be familiar with. The first term is the tolerable exception or deviation rate. TER or TDR, and that's said by the auditor. In some textbook, they call them T T tolerable exception rate and some tolerable deviation rate. In different CPA review companies, they call them differently. Basically, it's the exception rate. It's a percentage. Rate means it's a percentage that the auditor will permit in the population and still be willing to conclude the control is operating in the transaction established during planning is acceptable. So simply put, how much are we willing to tolerate tolerate in errors and still in deviation from that control and still think that the control is good? Okay? Now, now we're going to set different exception rate for different controls. Now, the higher we set this rate, the easier to clear the control. Simply put, if we say we're going to set the deviation rate at 3% versus 10%. 3% means that control is important. We cannot tolerate a lot of mistakes. Let's assume we're dealing with transaction that has high, high, uh, high value. Well, we cannot tolerate any errors, 3%. If we are dealing with an internal control that's not as important, we might be able to tolerate, set the tolerable deviation rate at a higher rate. So we have to understand how this affects the sampling. If we choose a lower toler tolerable exception or deviation rate, it means more work we have to do. So simply put, make sure you make take notes of this. We're going to, at the end, look at how all of these affect sampling. But simply put, lower TER, it means more and more sampling. And the opposite is true. If, you, if you're willing to tolerate more, then you don't have to, to do more work. You will do less of N. For the purpose of our example, because I'm going to go through a comprehensive example, make a note of it. Our tolerable exception rate is 7%. We set it at 7%. Again, we set this rate. We're willing to accept 7% in this control and still think it's working properly. The second concept, the acceptable risk of over-reliance or ARO. You need to understand what this is. It's the risk. It's the risk that the other the, the auditor is willing to take, except, except, willing to take of accepting a control as effective when the true population exception is greater than the tolerable exception rate. So remember, you said the tolerable exception rate at seven percent. Now you're going to sample, and when you sample, you take a risk. Okay, the true population exception could be twelve percent. You don't know, like the true, if you know the true population exception, then why do all the sampling? You don't know this true population sample. That's the problem. The problem is you don't know the true population sample. So here you are really taking a risk. That's the problem. You are taking a risk. Let me just highlight what I need to highlight here. Okay, you're taking a risk. So why do we set it at zero, five, or 10? What does that mean? If we set this ARO at zero, which is we don't, but if we set it at zero, it means we cannot take any risk. We're not taking any risk. What does that mean? It means you have to audit. You look at everything 100%. Okay, but we, you don't do you don't do so. That's why I, I chose zero just to kind of give you the idea that if you said my ARO is zero, it means look at everything. Okay. Now let's move from zero to five percent. What does that mean? Five percent. It means you are taking a 5% chance you could be wrong, okay? You could be wrong, but you are 95%, you are taking a 95% chance that your numbers are good. Your numbers are good. Let's assume you go from 
five to ten percent now you are you are taking more of a chance now you are saying i am 90 percent confidence that what i'm doing with when i'm testing this internal control my true population rate is not higher than the tolerable exception rate i'm taking a 90 percent chance well if you take a more chance if you take more chance you can lower your sample because you are taking more of a chance if you said you know i'm willing to my aro to be 20 percent well guess what i could be 20 percent wrong but, but i I'm, I'm willing to accept that risk okay therefore i don't have to do a lot of work so higher aro the lower is the sample the lower is the sample and usually that, that will be given to you whether you're a college student or a cpa candidate that that uh, the table will be given to you now we have to deal with something called estimated population exception rate what is that again it's a percentage it's the exception rate it's a percentage that the auditor expect to find in the population before testing they would say we we're going to expect to find a certain number now the higher we expect to find generally speaking it will drive our sample up so if we expect to find more errors we're going to have to have higher sample because it, we might there's a lot of errors in this population you, this usually drives the sample higher and the opposite is true now can it be more can this number can eper the expect estimated population rate can this number be higher than tolerable exception rate if it is higher don't sample just don't you cannot rely on the control so if you if, if we set ter at seven percent if we accept 10 percent then don't do any work if you expect to find 10 percent and you can only you can only tolerate seven you don't you, you just say i'm not going to use those internal control okay because i cannot tolerate more than seven and i expect to find 10 so that cannot be the case for the purpose of our example we're going to set it at four so remember the ter is seven and the estimated population exception rate is four because we're going to go back and look at these numbers so i want you to copy them copy them down now now we're going to look at terms that we use sampling terms in the evaluation phase and we're going to be assuming we're going to be working with a sample of 100 and soon we're going to learn how to compute that sample sample of 100 first we have to know the exception how many exception or errors did we find e exceptions or exceptions or errors we could find more than one error okay so for our purposes we're going to say the exception from our attribute and the sample is one i just select now we have a sample of 100 account receivable um we're, we're looking for the uh, manager's approval credit manager's approval for the sale and we find one sale where the manager did not approve it 100 samples one now we're going to be computing the exception deviation rate rate is a percentage simply put it's the percentage of item in a population that include the deviation so one over 100 which is for the purpose of our sample is one percent okay one percent now we need to compute something called the computed upper deviation rate or cure how do we compute cure what is cure first what is cure cure is the upper limit of the probable population exception rate so because we are sampling remember we selected 100 of i don't know how many maybe 1000 we we did find one percent but this is only sampling so we because we're sampling there could be more mistakes how do we find the probability of having mo more mistakes what's the highest exception rate in the population giving an an aro now this one we have to compute there's a table and we not compute we have to find in a table so let me show you how to find this number in the table so this is the table first of all make sure you are using the like especially on the cpa exam the we are using an aro of five five percent of risk of of uh, over reliance the sample size we are dealing with here's the sample size is 100 and actual number of exception found is one and the rate is 4.7 simply put what we can say is the upper deviation rate or the upper uh, the upper exception rate is 4.7 it means this is the probability because again we sampled but we're going to assume although we found one we could we could have up to 4.7 this is how what's our upper expect uh, exception rate okay we found one but we could we could we could go up to 4.7 now once you have this number as long as this number okay if the 
TDR, tolerable exception rate, is higher, we accept. Remember the TDR or the TER, what we set, we can tolerate seven. And what we're saying here, we found one, but we think it could be 4.7. Guess what? We are still below what we can tolerate. Therefore, we accept the control as working properly. We accept the control as working properly. Now we need to learn how to find a sample, an attribute sampling. How to find a sample? Well, here's the formula. N, the sample, equal to R divided by TER, tolerable exception rate. Now, what is R? R is, the, is something called the precision factor. How precise do we want to be? Let's think about this number. So we're going to take a number divided by tolerable exception rate and find the sampling. Okay, how, do, how precise do you want to be? How precise do you want to be? Let's think about it. Let's assume you are working in the election and you want the election results, you, you, your, uh, 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 your sample to be plus or minus 2%. So you, you are willing to be precise within 2%, plus or minus 2%. Well, let's assume you want to be plus or minus 1% rather than 2%. What do you have to do if you go from 2 to 1? Well, if you go from 2% to 1%, you want to be more precise. What's going to happen is your N, your sample, it's going to go up. If you want to be more precise, you have to you have to do more work. You have to do more sampling. Let's assume you're willing, you know, they said, don't worry, you can be within 10% precise, which is not really precise at all, then you don't have to go outside, go out there and collect more samples. You could collect less samples. And simply put, let's look at some, some figures just to see from a mathematical perspective. If R is 10 and the tolerable exception rate is two, your sample size, your sample size will be five. Let's assume you are willing to take um, on more precision. If you get 10, 20, divided by two, if you want to be, I'm sorry, more precise, if you go from 10 to 20, if you want to be more precise, your sample would equal to 10. If you want to be more precise, you want to have more samples. You collect more samples. So let's keep the, let's keep the N is the same, uh, R is the same, and let's assume you're gonna go from two, you can tolerate, rather than two, you can tolerate five exception rate. Well, guess what? Your sample goes down. And remember, if you can, what we talked about earlier, if we can tolerate more mistakes, tolerable exception rate, if this goes up, remember, N goes down. Make sure you know those relationship. Remember, when it comes to R, if you want to be more precise, you do more work. If you want to be less precise, you do less work. Make sure to know the, these relationship, okay? And usually R is giving, is giving, in, in, in an auditing course, as well as on the CPA exam, it's a number that's giving. But remember, it's influenced by the expected deviation rate. Okay, expected deviation rate. The more deviation you find, the more you are going to, you, the more you are going to sample. Okay. Now remember, TER is the, is, the, is the tolerable exception rate or the tolerable deviation rate. The same thing again, depending on the textbook that you use. Now let me show you how the sample size is affected using different factors. So let me go ahead and to the next slide. So let's assume we are working with a 5% risk of over-reliance. And let's assume for the, sake, for the sake of illustration, we are dealing estimated population rate, exception rate, 1%. Okay, so we estimate the population exception rate to be 1%. Notice, what's the relationship between the expected population rate and, and the sampling? Notice, if we go from 1 to 2, and let's assume we are dealing with tolerable exception rate of 5. If we go from 1, 1, notice we need, for 1, a sample of 93. If the ex estimated population exception rate is higher, 2, notice we keep tolerable exception rate the same. We'll, we'll, have, we'll need 153, not 181. No, it's 181. So notice, as EPER goes up, everything else is equal, your N will go up, okay? If you expect to find more, if, you, if your estimated population expectation to have more errors, you have to widen your net. You have to collect more sample. Now, let's look at the tolerable exception rate. So notice, 
if we are dealing with an estimated population exception rate of one and now we're going to go from three percent we can tolerate three percent versus four percent if we go from three percent to four percent notice if our tolerable exception rate goes up if we can tolerate more we can accept less of an end notice as we go move along tolerable exception rate as we're moving from one to two to three to four to five if we are willing to accept more we have to do less work we have to do less work and the last thing i'm gonna talk about which is we already talked about is if if you are relying five percent reliance or ten percent this is a table for ten percent ten percent reliance let's go back so let's assume we are dealing with okay again estimated population exception rate of one and the tolerable exception rate is four therefore our sample is 156 given a five percent risk of over reliance now i'm going to go to the next slide i'm going to go with one and four but i'm going to change the table what do you think is going to happen if i'm willing to accept more risk i should have a lower sample let's see so this is the 10 percent table one four and notice i only have to collect 96 sample versus 156 notice as as my my the risk of over reliance goes up i'm taking more risk therefore my population i have to do simply less less work so hopefully this recording help you understand this important topic for your cpa exam like you cannot take any chances with this topic i do i you know you know you could view i i did work um, couple examples about this make sure you view them make sure to know the relationship between all these accounts but at the end of the day not accounts all these terms at the end of the day i would like to remind you to check out my website farhatlectures.com once again i'm not going to replace your cpa review course i explained this in details so it will help you when you take your cpa review course it will help you do a better job and that's what i'll try to do think of me as the person that's prepping you for your prep course for your cpa prep course Study hard, good luck, and stay safe.